In almost every public place today, the ears are assailed by the sound of pop music. In shopping malls, public houses, restaurants, hotels and elevators, the ambient sound is not human conversation, but the music disgorged into the air by speakers, usually invisible and inaccessible speakers that cannot be punished for their impertinence. Some places brand themselves with their own signature sound, folk, jazz, or excerpts from the Broadway musicals. For the most part, however, the prevailing music is of an astounding banality. It is there in order not to be really there. It is a background to the business of consuming things, a surrounding nothingness on which we scribble the graffiti of our desires. The worst forms of this music, sometimes known after the trade name as Muzak, are produced without the intervention of musicians, being put together on a computer from a repertoire of standard effects. The background sounds of modern life are therefore less and less human. Rhythm, which is the sound of life, has been largely replaced by electrical pulses, produced by a machine programmed to repeat itself ad infinitum, and to thrust its booming bass notes into the very bones of the victim. Whole areas of civic space in our society are now policed by this sound, which drives anybody with the slightest feeling for music to distraction and ensures that for many of us, a visit to the pub or a meal in a restaurant have lost their residual meaning. These are no longer social events, but experiments in endurance as you shout at each other over the deadly noise. There are two reasons why this vacuous music has flown into every public space. One is the vast change in the human ear brought about by the mass production of sound. The other is the failure of the law to protect us from the result. For our ancestors, music was something that you sat down to listen to, or which you made for yourself. It was a ceremonial event in which you participated, either as a passive listener or as an active performer. Either way, you were giving and receiving life, sharing in something of great social significance. With the advent of the gramophone, the radio, and now the iPod, music is no longer something that you must make for yourself, nor is it something that you sit down to listen to. It follows you about wherever you go, and you switch it on as a background. It is not so much listened to as overheard. The banal melodies and mechanical rhythms, the stock harmonies recycled in song after song, these things signify the eclipse of the musical ear. For many people, music is no longer a language shaped by our deepest feelings, no longer a place of refuge from the tawdriness and distraction of everyday life, no longer an art in which gripping ideas are followed to their distant conclusions. It is simply a carpet of sound, designed to bring all thought and feeling down to its own level, lest something serious might be felt or said. And there is no law against it. You are rightly prevented from polluting the air of a restaurant with smoke, but nothing prevents the owner from inflicting this far worse pollution on his customers, pollution that poisons not the body but the soul. Of course you can ask for the music to be turned off, but you will be met by blank and even hostile stares. What kind of a weirdo is this who wants to impose his will on everyone? Who is he to dictate the noise levels? Such is the usual response. Background music is the default position. It is no longer silence to which we return when we cease to speak, but the empty chatter of the music box. Silence must be excluded at all cost, since it awakens you to the emptiness that looms on the edge of modern life, threatening to confront you with the dreadful truth that you have nothing whatever to say. On the other hand, if we knew silence for what once it was, as the plastic material that is shaped by real music, then it would not frighten us at all.